All right, summary of day two of advanced integration. Um, remember, this is just my summary. This is my this is where my head went uh, as I was listening to the content. And um, today, Lori Thompson spent the first good chunk of the day talking about the pelvis. And both times that I've taken pelvis restoration, they've been taught by Lori um, Lori Thompson, and she is a fantastic teacher. I uh, very much enjoy listening to her, learning from her, um, and just, yeah, like, just knows her stuff in and out. And the humility that she shows uh, as she's teaching, also, i um, willing to, you know, admit when she has made mistakes in the past, it really helps. Someone like myself um, know that it is a learning process. Um, and so where my mind went today, actually, when we're talking about the pelvis, it made me think about volleyball a lot. So, you know, volleyball is a game where most of the sport is played in the air or not. It's not most of it's played in the air. It's uh, all the main actions happen in the air. So, you know, attacking's in the air, blocking, setting, serving, um, really the only skills that aren't in the air are digging and passing. So as a setter, um, I think about this, you know, back extension that we have to get into. So, you know, because as setters, we're raising both hands above our heads, um, you know, we're tending towards that back extension. So I was thinking a lot about um, my countryman, TJ Sanders, who used to play, used to be the setter for our national team um, for the last number of years, um, you know, an exceptional setter and really, um, you know, mastermind of, of the game. And, uh, he, you know, he had some pretty significant back issues during his career. So, you know, I was thinking about him and thinking about um, those um, back injuries that he had being a setter. So, you know, uh, hyperextended through both sides of our back. So not just one, but both sides. But then we're also, you know, looking up um, at the ball. So we have a lot of, you know, neck extension um, as well because we have to look up at the ball and raise both hands above our head. So when that becomes a problem... Uh, or when that becomes a pattern um, and we can't get out of that, then it becomes a problem, especially for the lower back. So, you know, and then you think about as a setter, um, you know, we, it's considered, or, you know, can be described as the quarterback of, of the volleyball court. So, you know, mentally and visually, we're viewing the game from the side. Uh, so we're trying to see our team and the other team um, as we have our right side to the net. Um, you know, we're doing a lot of peripheral vision work, trying to pick up our own team, the other team to make decisions. Um, so that's while the play is going on, not to mention we're constantly game planning and thinking about, you know, what sets have worked, what sets haven't worked, what's the other team doing, how are we going to set our team up for the best success, you know, how are we going to put the other team into some trouble. Um, so there's lots of mental game going on. So you think about that pattern of extension. Um, and in postural restoration terms, we'd be a lot of us would be PECs, posterior exterior chain dominant, um, and then uh, tack on the the sort of mental, um, yeah, the mental stress, which is normal for a setter uh, that we have to experience as setters. So um, just how that can feed into pattern, um, yeah, just it made me think about that a lot today, dealing with pelvis, um, even though we were dealing with. You know pelvis and shifting from side to side and and um how to test for those things uh for the different positions um it's just where my mind went so um yeah it made me think about uh about that as setters and also this this uh help that we can give to to you know our overhead athletes um to uh you know any of our volleyball players um you know we jump off two feet in volleyball and now it's you know we're not always perfectly equal but um you know we're not really jumping like a layup in basketball we're jumping off one foot um except for the middle blockers when they run a step around but you know most of the time we're jumping off two feet and you know sort of landing on two feet but not really we're going to land on one foot more than the other and just those ingrained patterns that come into uh, come into play as we um you know do most players are right-handed so they're doing a left right left footwork um you know sort of powering off that left foot but then uh, transitioning that horizontal force into vertical force through that right step and then onto the left before taking off. So just think about all those forces that are going through that pelvis 
um, down through the femur and up through the thorax. So, you know, when I was learning, uh, reviewing pelvis today, that's where my mind went. But one of the big takeaways for me from today is, uh, which we spent basically the second half of the day talking about these two tests, this Haruska adduction lift test and the Haruska abduction lift test. Um, you know, these are, uh, uh, what I realize is that I need to, I need to do more testing with my clients. Um, I do try, uh, especially with my rehab clients, I do testing um, pretty much every time I see them, but I think I need to do more of them. Um, and the reason why I need to do more of those tests is it really helps guide treatment decisions. And that really takes me back to one of the main reasons I started doing uh, or taking the PRI courses was as a kinesiologist, um, I didn't want to go back to school for two more years um, to do physiotherapy or massage therapy. Um, you know, I had one child at the time and another child on the way when I was just getting into this stuff. And so um, the thought of going back to school for two more years was just um, not something that would have been beneficial for, um, you know, my family. So I didn't. Um, but as a kinesiologist, being able to take these courses, uh, I still don't have manual therapy capability, which I'm totally fine with because these non-manual techniques that uh, PRI offers are so incredibly powerful. Um, and so one of the reasons that I kept going down the PRI uh, rabbit hole uh, is because I started testing my clients um, and the tests were sort of, okay, they're showing what you know, PRI says, but the bigger thing was the interventions, the non-manual techniques were proving to be so effective at changing that. And so what I could do is I could more deeply assess uh, my clients and sort of get to some root causes of issues. And then the bigger thing was prescribe. Um, and so I'm still working at that, uh, still learning, you know, taking courses like this and learning from other um, healthcare practitioners that are way smarter than me. But uh, it's really helping me to see, okay, yeah, don't be afraid to do these tests to to help guide, to make decisions on, you know, these positions that we, you know, we all struggle getting into, maybe not struggle getting into, but we all have to work to get into. Um, but then, you know, we can, we can start to master them. Our nervous systems can accept these positions. Um, and make yeah it it does get easier it's not uh this is a therapy uh like this type of therapy this active therapy is therapy that is more far more permanent and longer lasting so um it's yeah it's something that uh once you can get a hold of like you as the as the client take it with you um and again that's the 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 biggest the most powerful part of uh, this whole PRI approach is um, is the empowerment of the client, which is which is you know for for me and um, my company, what my philosophy is that I want to you know have clients be able to therapize themselves. It's maybe not a word, I don't know, but um, I don't want them to have to need me for therapy. Um, I know it's a bad business model because it means that they may not come back to me, but um, but I'm okay with that because I would rather people uh, not need me to to be adjusted, not need me to uh, be able to deal with their little issues that crop up, but rather um, have them understand these positions that they need to get into, have them understand um, compression of certain areas expansion of their rib cage twist rotation airflow and when they can control that then then they can do a lot of this on their own and then if they want to go further then it's like okay what do you want to do you want to strength train great let's strength train you want to uh, train as an athlete great let's train as an athlete you want to just stay healthy so that you you know keep move you, you have good movement quality and you just want to be able to you know walk or um you know, hike or play with your kids without pain. Um, yeah, great. We can do that too. So anyway, that was my takeaway from today was, uh, yeah, a lot of volleyball thought, but then a lot of retesting. Um, 
to really help my treatment decisions, my, my, uh, my exercise prescription decisions, which is what we as kinesiologists do for a living. We prescribe exercise and we got to find what is the best exercise for our client at that time to help them uh, get what they need, but also help get what they want. Um, so a little bit of both there. So that's my takeaway from day two. So I still got two more days to go. Um, we'll see what, uh, what tomorrow brings. Of course, I always look forward to this and, uh, yeah, I look forward to these opportunities to learn from, from this faculty. If you uh, are interested in a PRI course and, and want to ask me questions, like, please ask questions. I, you know, love to, to talk about the, the Institute and all that they offer. Um, and, uh, it is well worth your, your time and, uh, your money and your energy to, to listen to what they have to say, to try it and to, yeah, to, to join the PRI nation, to join the PRI family. So thanks again for day two. And, uh, yeah, we're going to look forward to day three.